Hey everybody, you found us. We are now on Rumble, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, and all the audio podcasts. We are now spread out. We've launched this show and we're really glad you found us and we hope you tell your friends because this is a fantastic place to talk about American freedom, American national security, and you know uh, our founding principles because we are off leash with Eric Prince. This is great, huh? Glad we're to launched. be here. We're out there. Giddy up. Yeah, giddy up. This is going to be fun. And here's what strikes me is I think people could spend hours watching cable news and learn nothing compared to watching one episode with us. I mean, it says well, a lot about your, your skill and expertise. We'll see. <laughs> Caveat emptor. No, no. We already know that much, okay? You know cable news. You know, and cable news is funny because, you know, you right. spend well, hours is maybe getting ready for a hit. Off leash and I'm off script. Yeah. I don't have any script. Totally. It's all for memory. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> We're going to focus on China. And I know I'm going to learn a lot from you today. And I want to start, first of all, with the South China Sea, because it seems to be the vehicle, the mechanism, the platform that China is using to essentially expand its reach and its power. Am I right? Yeah, sure. So you have to think back to um, when China opened up, somewhat against their will, back in the 1840s, and they had the, uh, the Opium Wars with the British and uh, ended up signing over a lease on, um, on Hong Kong, in the Kowloon um, Peninsula, uh, the south of China. Um, every threat that started in their, what they call their century of humiliation came by sea. <clears throat> First the British, then the Americans, then the other European trading colonies, which set up in uh, Shanghai. Um, uh, when you've heard of the Boxer Rebellion, that was really happened between, um, uh, between Shanghai and um, Peking, not Beijing. It was always Peking. Right. And, um, and then after that, the Imperial Japanese Navy brought the Imperial Japanese Army. And, and so they, they were ravaged from 1840 until what they regard as 1949 when the communists uh, successfully took over the country. After the Civil War. The Civil War. Yep. And then they, they claimed to have stopped it. So you've heard of the Great Wall of China, which is built along the northern border of China, which was to keep Mongol horsemen out from invading um, those threats. So effectively what they did is build a, what they thought was a maritime wall by creating sovereign territory out of really thin air. And they did it and they claimed it to the detriment of their neighbors and certainly to the detriment of, of freedom of navigation in the area. So now this past couple of decades, you've got this dynamic where China is, first of all, they're, they're, they're constantly aggressive using their own Coast Guard with aggressive tactics. Uh, but then what's fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating, is they're creating sovereign territory right in the middle of the ocean, right? Yes. Just out, out of nowhere. So you got, let's start with when this began, and then I want to get into understanding what the heck are these islands that they're building? All the neighbors around China have always really pushed back against um, Sinoization, meaning they don't want to be subsumed and absorbed by, by China, by the language, by the culture, or to be ruled from, by the Chinese mandarins. And so if you think of China as a force, almost like a rugby scrum, where they're constantly pushing, and if you relax at all, they gain ground. And if you relax at all, they gain ground. Or like a tug of war that just, they never ever relent. And so in the case of um, these islands in the South China Sea, I actually met in my travels in China, um, the CEO of a Chinese state-owned enterprise. I think it was called China Harbor and Dredge. And over a lot of uh, baiju, which is some awful strong local li liquor, I got him to admit <laughs> that um, uh, they had no plans it was not even in their wildest strategic dreams to build these islands in the South China Sea. But they found the Obama administration early on to be so vapid that they didn't push back on anything. So they just said, hell with it, try it. They don't do the environmental impact statement. And so what they do is they basically look on a, on a navigation chart for any shallow water where there's a reef, 
where there's a shoal, meaning it's not an island, but it's something that is um, uh, maybe one to two, ten feet below the water, but it's very, very shallow. And they would first, and so the, the, the Chinese, they like, um, I described China during the Trump administration as the neighbor that keeps building their fence in your yard. <laughs> right. One foot a year. One foot a year. And Trump was the first one that said, hey, get the hell back on your side of the line. Mm -hmm. But the way they do this with um, um, the South China Sea, <clears throat> if you see these islands, um, they would find a shallow spot that really wasn't claimed, not defended. And they would first send what's called the Chinese Maritime Militia, which is hundreds, if not thousands of fishing boats manned by Chinese nationals, generally with crew, the captain or a couple of the officers being Chinese naval personnel. So it's effectively like a naval auxiliary so that they're doing commercial stuff. So it's fishing boats. Fishing boats. So-called. So fishing boats that go and swarm an area and just stay there. They might not be fishing, but they're maintaining presence. And then once, you know, they test. They test, they probe. Consequences? No consequences. Okay, here comes the big, um, the big dredge barge and the, the machinery. And they put a huge sucker on the bottom and they just suck up the seabed and they start dredging and piling up sand, building islands. And they've done that all over the South China Sea. And once they, once they have that island there and it starts to settle, then they build a port, they build a runway, they build bases. And they say, oh, no, we're not. This is all for peaceful purposes. This is just for um, weather reporting and search and rescue. Okay? All right, so, so, so this started because they saw weakness in the Obama administration. Clearly, right, they, early they, on. They saw apathy and no one pushed back. And so they tried it and no Navy, no, nobody reacted. And so they did it dozens more times. And so they've claimed thousands of acres of new sovereign territory of just the land. And then they, of course they claim the 200 mile exclusive economic zone around that new sovereign piece of land. So they've claimed millions of square miles of ocean by plunking down these islands that they created. And of course, like I said, they claim it's going to be search and rescue or weather reporting, but within a couple of years, there's a military it's airfield, military base. there's radars, there's surface to surface missiles. There's all the things to project power from, basically like um, building lots of fixed aircraft carriers out in the middle of the South China Sea out of what was thin air. That are permanently moored. Okay, so they've got 20 outposts in the Paracel Islands, which is yep, right just there between Hainan. Vietnam yes. and the Philippines. Right in the middle of it. I mean, it's right in the middle of the South China Sea. They've got seven uh, outposts in the Spratleys, South of that, the Spratly Islands. Now look at how far south that is. That's a that's You're amazing. almost to the southern end of the Philippines. It's a, that's extraordinary to me. And they control the Scarborough Shoal, which they seized in 2012, and they're just maintaining a constant Coast Guard presence to sort of. And the and the latest one they're doing is going after a Philippine-held island where there's actually an old uh, shipwrecked vessel that has been a Philippines outpost for the last 50, 60 years. And the, the Chinese are surrounding it and trying to block the Filipinos from resupplying it. So it's, they're continuing to play that game, even though the U.S. is supposedly woken up to the threat. And that's the problem. It's a lack of imagination in the national security elites, because the first time they saw this happen, or maybe if it wasn't the first time, maybe by the third time, to say, OK, what options do we have to push back and stop them from doing this? Well, one, um, I come from a Navy background, right? I was a, I was a. I was a frogman for a few years. Lots of things you can do to, to mess with their happiness. You could mine the seabed. S just a small custom explosive that gets pulled up through that dredge, blow up the dredge. You get the idea. Right. Nobody's going to get killed, but it's definitely a smack it's in the It's damaging. Mm -hmm. Sure. Second, there's stuff you can spray on that island, which basically makes the, um, the adhesion of the sand collapse. And so literally that island that they created just melts back into the sea, almost like putting. Um, like putting uh, di uh, dish soap on grease. Right. It would just make it dissolve. Break it up. Again, that's where the intelligence community has to be creative, devious, and bold to present decision makers with options to push back. Because again, China wants to operate just below the, the threshold of conflict, but against uh, uh, obvious armed conflict, but really conflict between states 
is everything from intelligence, economic, political, long before military. And so if you have a security apparatus that doesn't want to tangle in the scrum, okay, that doesn't want to, that just wants to have um, environmental, global warming, ESG conferences, that's all that's important to you, instead of saying... DEI. DEI. Right. And instead of saying, ah, that's sovereign territory, or we're not going to let you create millions of square miles of new land, new territory out of, of what you're doing, you have to be willing to engage in the other realms that don't involve sanctions, but maybe it involves daring just below kinetic operations oh, just, that, are not done, that are not done by uniformed soldiers in an in a, in a, in a intelligence world, paramilitary role to push back because that's an example that they claim now the entire South China Sea is a weaponized military base for China. See where else they go with it. Well, because it's a model all, that's working for them. But all you're suggesting is to act in kind to what the Chinese are doing. But isn't it too late? I mean, look, you've got this first island chain, second island chain. Explain that to me, right? Because they're linking them together, right? So the first island chain um, extends from the Ryukyu Islands, from the southern, uh, south from Japan to Taiwan. Um, the second island chain extends out, and the third goes all the way out to Guam. If you can keep them contained in the first island chain, it gives their submarines a lot less maneuver area where they can get out unsupervised and near America's shores, right? We're a, we're a maritime power. America is highly dependent on trade, and we don't want unfriendly submarines coming right up in our backyard off of San Francisco and uh, LA and San Diego or Portland or, uh, or Seattle as they were during the World War II with Japanese subs. Um, I mean, the only uh, successful attack on the, Jap on the U.S. mainland was from a Japanese submarine launching fire balloons to try to burn down our forests. But again, so keeping them contained in the chain is what we should be focusing on. And at a huge fail that we gave them, largely most of the South China Sea. Where else they go in terms of claiming sovereign Filipino territory, or from Indonesia, uh, or from Malaysia. Uh, you know, the, each one of those countries is not strong enough to stand up to China on its own. That's kind of the idea. If, if U.S. is going to be the big brother, then be the big brother when the scrum starts. And, and sadly, the, uh, the smart people in Washington have been ignoring that for a couple of decades. Now. So, and it's clear that they're matching this territorial expansion with, with this propaganda game. So, for instance, like just this week, they are in discussions with their uh, neighbors for a non-aggression act, you know, over the South China Sea, which to, to me seems like just propaganda crap. Right. They, so you, they, the they, they, they create the islands out of thin air. They then say it's only going to be for search and rescue, but then they weaponize it and they say, oh, it's not going to be non-aggression. It's, it's, it's non-aggression. We're here for purple, peaceful purposes. Which is a gray zone tactic. We're, we're loaded. Yeah, exactly. They absolutely amplify and push in every area of the gray zone until someone makes them stop. And um, the U.S. does not do gray zone well at all because we have so many bureaucrats that are very risk averse, sitting with lawyers sitting over them, and especially with decision makers on top of them. And these are people that don't understand risk. Uh, you know, Clausewitz, the old Prussian military philosopher, said there's two kinds of courage to fight a war. Individual soldiers' courage and the, individual, and, and the courage for the leadership to make, um, to send uh, to commit their people to an uncertain outcome, moral courage. And, and when you have bureaucrats that don't want, don't even dare engage in the gray zone, makes it more likely that we have to engage in a hot zone against a nuclear armed enemy. Guys in wearing suits in office buildings, right? Who are making these decisions in Washington. Yep. Who have chosen not to engage the Chinese. I mean, this blows my mind that they've created new territory, new sovereign territory all across the South Th China thousands Sea. Thousands of acres. Their cost, put it this way, their cost of developing an aircraft carrier by dredging, building an island, all the rest, is vastly cheaper than the $9 billion that we have to spend to build one or actual aircraft now, carrier. Nimitz or Ford class aircraft carrier. <laughs> that Correct. is incredible. But, you know, it's the visual that gets me. Looking at these islands, I mean, they, are, uh, they look like they've been there for thousands of years. These are islands. They've got buildings on them and, and airstrips. It's a, it's a dredged island as, as much of a, uh, of a created world as Disney World is. Yeah. 
or uh, the or the west side of Manhattan. <laughs> yes. Out, right. Yep. In, in you know entire neighborhoods built on dredged section of Manhattan on the yep. west side. Created land. Created land. Blows my mind. Now, the uh, in the South China Sea, there's also supposedly billions, 11 billion barrels of untapped oil, 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. How does that play into, into the Sure, it's rationale? been a big problem for, for Vietnam, for Malaysia. All these guys have centuries-old territorial claims to this area. And whenever they go out and explore it, then the Chinese send, again, send this maritime militia backed by the uh, Chinese uh, Coast Guard, which is gunned up, backed again by the Chinese Navy. So these layers of escalation in the scrum that um, the U.S. Navy often doesn't engage in. And so it's really made all the neighbors exceedingly wary of, uh, of what China is doing as the hegemon in the area. And instead of really enforcing freedom of navigation, they're doing it on Chinese terms. Right. Well, and on top of that, so even last fall, uh, Chinese ships blocked and collided with Philippine vessels. I mean, they're actually, you know, oh, yeah. having contact. They're actually ramming. Ramming. Yes. And that, so this is just the big bully in the block, and nobody is standing up to him. Uh, no, not really. No, either the U.S. still does some uh, freedom of navigation stuff. They'll still once in a while send a ship through the, uh, the straits between Taiwan and the mainland. But that's uh, few and far between. And when they do, the Chinese end up shooting all kinds of missiles over Taiwan. They go crazy. They freak out about it. And all the U.S. is doing is a freedom of navigation exercise. But, but Trump, I mean, Trump did at least that, correct? He did. I mean, yep. did, did he, what else took place during Trump's years in office? The biggest thing that scared the Chinese the most was tariffs, was the idea. Because they're an extremely export-dependent country. And, and if those export markets are threatened, it's... Um, it is extremely scary to them. Look, the Chinese are trying to extend uh, naval hegemony out. Why? Because they import about 80% of their hydrocarbons. So all the oil and gas that comes out of the Middle East, comes around India, comes right here down, right at the bottom of the Straits of Malacca, right below Malaysia there. Right. That's a, that, it's only about a mile and a half wide there at the, at the narrows of the Straits of Malacca. And once it's up in the South China Sea, they're trying to protect that, that reach. Now, they always had access to it before. Now they're just making it almost more but, likely for conflict to, to resolve. But therein lies their vulnerability, correct? I mean, why aren't we putting pressure on them with that vulnerability? If they're so import dependent. For yes, lots of ways to, to push them back from claiming new territory to say, hey, by the way, um, these ships aren't getting through. Can you hear me now? Right. Well... Obviously, Taiwan is massive strategic interest. That's what we're going to hit on when we come back here with Off Leash and Eric Prince. Imagine a technology company built to restore your privacy, not take it away. You and your phone are constantly bombarded with tracking, surveillance, propaganda, and digital attacks. Even big tech companies claiming to protect privacy create their own back doors. Unplugged restores what's been lost, starting with a messenger, a VPN, a mobile antivirus. The Unplugged App Bundle gives you back what's rightfully yours. Unplugged. Restore your privacy. All right, we're back, everybody. Thanks for coming back to us. We are talking about China, and naturally, we got to dig deep into Taiwan. So, Eric, I need a little history lesson here on Taiwan and how we got here. I understand that with the Civil War in 1949, that sort of created this, uh, this bastion for the elites uh, and military and so forth. It was kind of like an outpost. But tell me the background on Taiwan before we get into modern day sure. conflict. So at the end of the, uh, of the communist, or of the Chinese Civil War, where the communists won, 1949, the, um, there was two major parties. The Communist Party of China, started by Mao Tse-Sung, uh, and the ruler of the uh, of the nationalists was a guy named Chiang Kai Shek, Shek. who is a Mao asshole. Chiang Kai Shek also an asshole <laughs> and a a super pompous, not likable guy. In 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 me, the the Americans and the Brits that had to work with him uh, during World War II hated his guts. They referred to him as Peanut because he had this 
big attitude of himself, and he was this little coward of a of a worm. So two forms of evil. Exactly. Right. Sadly, there was there was a a terrible horse to bet on and a bad horse to bet on. Mm -hmm. um, but the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai Shek fled to the island, what was called Formosa, uh, and um, it became Taiwan. Uh, that island had actually been a Japanese colony for almost 100 years. So still in the rural parts of Taiwan, the people speak Japanese. Right. When the president of Taiwan goes to Japan, they speak Japanese together. They don't speak English. They don't speak Mandarin. They speak, they speak Japanese. All right. That says a lot about the history of the island. Yes. So you have, and it's so, so Taiwan as a society is never fully gelled because you had um, ancient um, Japanese linkages, also some, some ancient Mandarin linkages, but not, um, but not uh, from the combing tongue. So you have these political elites that abandon the mainland, but they have these ideas that they're going to rule all of China again, still, still part of their policy. Um, you have Mandarin folks that have lived there for centuries, and then you have the, the Japanese tinge. So as a national identity, they have, they have some challenges. Um, the mainland, the Communist Ch Party of China, hates Taiwan. It is the ultimate burr into their saddle because it's basically, it's Mandarin culture on freedom instead of Mandarin culture under communism. So it's only like 24 million people, which is smaller than some of the mid-sized cities in the mainland China mm -hmm. on all of Taiwan. And it's still a huge issue. And so the likelihood, so the next thing to happen, and you've gone back and forth politically between the Kuomintang and, um, and now the DPP, the Democratic People's Party. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the interesting twist, there's, so there's an election, a presidential election in January of 2024. You have the DPP, the current ruling party of, China, of Taiwan, very progressive, woke, kind of focusing even on transgender crazy issues. You have the KMT has been the um, uh, the kind of the pro Beijing, pro Beijing right. party, and then you have now Terry Guo, who is the CEO owner of Foxconn Industries, which makes all the iPhones all through China. Was trying to run as the candidate for the KMT, and they didn't even want him, and so now he's running again as the most pro Beijing party. So interesting twist. If you're using an iPhone, you're using it made in a factory that is a thousand percent in lockstep with the Chinese Communist Does Party. Does that not show, if that isn't a reflection of how captive Apple and Tim Cook are to the CCP, I don't know what it, I, am I right? Is that fair to say? Exactly. Yes. Because it, it, even, even injecting himself into the political process of Taiwan with all his assets subject to the CCP uh, boot, inside mainland You'd China. You'd think that they would have made shifts and policy changes at Apple to yeah, get uh, manufacturing a, off the mainland. Put a, put a plant in the dollar, Brazil or India or somewhere. I, yes, they're kind of working towards that now, but they are still controlled. Anyway, so that election is January of 2024. Um, I would be, you have very tight weather windows to try to do an, an invasion in Taiwan. You have uh, obviously, it's 100 miles of open ocean between the mainland uh, and, and, uh, and Taiwan. You can actually see there are islands that belong to Taiwan right next to the mainland, like Kuimoi and Matsu. Back in the 50s, after the, the CCP took over mainland China, there was regular artillery duels where the, the mainland would fire artillery at these Taiwanese outposts. You can see Kinmen, this is called Kuimoi, uh, and Matsu up north. I could see a, a, uh, a scenario where, kind of like China created all these islands in the South China Sea, where they create some kind of a security incident or some completely fabricated bullshit reason right. to have 10, 100, 500 fishing vessels, Chinese maritime militia mm -hmm. surrounding and blockading this island. Blockade, right. And then, and then the thing is, okay, they're going to watch and see what people do. How does the West respond? How does Taiwan respond? How does Japan respond? And then they do it again and again and again, and they can slice that salami and dial up that pressure. And so that's where uh, the U.S. has to have lots of hybrid, clever ways to trim the wings to deliver consequences to the CCP in a attributable or non-attributable way. Because remember, China imports 70, 80% of their energy, 
hydrocarbons, a huge amount of their food. They are hugely trade dependent. And uh, there's ways to, um, to mess with their happiness that we have to be ready for because as you look at Xi Jinping's speeches, and especially the ones that are in Mandarin that he delivers to like the, the standing committee and then the Politburo, mm -hmm. they don't really get translated into English. I don't read Mandarin, but I, but I have friends that get them translated properly. And the Chinese are absolutely preparing for conflict. They're making themselves sanction proof by selling off tens, hundreds of billions of dollars of assets in the West, whether it's the biggest leasing company for, um, for all the aircraft, the commercial aircraft in China, right. uh, banks, hotel real estate, all through the United States, selling it at, at very, very discounted prices. Why? Because they're preparing for the inevitable great conflict. These are Xi Jinping's words right. with the West. And, and Xi Jinping actually says, we are here not just to do Taiwan, we are here to overthrow and re- Imagine the Westphalian order, which is like the, the, the order of, of nation states relating to each other that we've had for almost the last 500 years. Okay. And to remake it with China as the center of the world. Okay, so we've got this expansion across the South, East, the South China Sea. You've got this tension that has just gotten to a boiling point with Taiwan. The U.S. has its one China policy, all right? Is that the right policy today? Look, we don't need to be supporting and, and giving them a reason to say, we don't need to say, oh, we support Taiwanese independence, so we're here going to back it, because right. we don't need to back that with any American blood. We should not. But uh, unless we're willing to completely roll and let the, 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 the communists take over Taiwan, uh, we should be pushing the Taiwanese government to adapt a lot of steps to harden themselves and to reduce the certainty that the CCP would have in taking it quickly. Now, are you talking about militarily? Um, the fastest, cheapest. Instead of having to send the Seventh Fleet and the very predictable playbook that the Chinese expect us to do, you know, you're exposing 5,000 American kids to very, what we think are very accurate Chinese ballistic missiles, not nuclear that can punch a hole in an aircraft carrier or a surface ship. I think as the, when you see the conflicts in Ukraine or along Gaza, that precision technology is now dispersed down to the very, very lowest level where somebody with a drone dropping a grenade can target. Right. Anything that can be located can be targeted quickly. Within so a, a big conventional aircraft carrier approach, driving in there to show power might be noble, but can also turn out as a very big flaming wreck. The cheapest, simplest way to deter the CCP from taking Taiwan is to create a significant home guard. And you think about the American population in 1775, 1776, you had 30 to 40% that were loyalists. They were wanting to stay with the crown. Right. Another 30, 40% in the middle that were just trying to survive. Around 30% that wanted independence. 10% of them, 3% were the only ones that took up arms. So it doesn't take that many people actively resisting to drive out. If Taiwan and their 24 million-ish people, we took 3% of that, was that 720,000? Even if it's a half a million. Because, you know, the Taiwanese armed forces are about 150 to 200,000, but they're highly corrupted, highly compromised um, with every significant weapon system they have very much pre-registered for multiple precision Chinese missiles. If, but what, what you can't really plan for is the will of people. And if you have 2 or 3% that are trained, armed with basic weapons, and they say not today, and you turn every village, every city block into another fortress. In the, in the old Blackwater days, we used to be able to take a complete negate person that never handled a gun before in their life. And in the first five-day course, take them from zero to being able to shoot, move, and communicate competently in a two-man or a four-man fire drill, moving through targets, engaging from 10 meters out to so that's 200 meters. the training that Taiwanese need. Yes. That's what you're talking about. So I'm talking about taking volunteers, 
-hmm. of that 3%. People from the CrossFit gym, people that are scout leaders, people that are firemen, people that are policemen, the kind of people that are engaged, okay? Not the non-playing characters Mm -hmm. that you see in a video game, (laughs) the guys that actually will go and do something and show up when something bad happens. Um, And you take them through some basic firearms, small unit tactics, urban ambush, how do you use the urban jungle as your uh, play area to really be able to ambush and operate and destroy the enemy? Again, preload them with training and then with small arms, demolition materials, some EFPs, the explosive form penetrators, will shred any, any tank they have, a little bit of uh, drone capability themselves, some FPV drones, and my God, you can make it exceedingly miserable because China, the, the communists, have to make this seizure of Taiwan go very quickly. They cannot, they cannot afford a year, year and a half prolonged combat like you see in Ukraine. Why? Because Russia is energy independent. They're a huge exporter. China is hugely energy dependent and very trade dependent. And so a resistance and fighting and ongoing combat in Taiwan is a disaster it's a for them. It's a distraction that they can't afford. No, no, it's not a distraction. It's a mortal threat because you could close the Straits of, uh, of Malacca down there by Singapore to all the oil trade that's coming around to the east coast of China, and you could really, really mess with their okay, happiness. But they, but they, look, China seems to be the aggressor with Taiwan right now. This very week, Taiwan said that China sent 43 military aircraft and seven ships near the self-ruled island. All right? And a clear sign that Beijing Beijing plans not to let up its campaign of pressure and harassment again. They're the aggressor, sure, right? No, well, so China, what's the thinking? What's their strategy to draw us in? Uh, it's, to, it's to constantly wear down by China sending up dozens of jets on an almost daily basis. It makes the Taiwanese uh, send their own jets just to intercept them, wave, give each other the bird. Nothing really happens. They don't shoot each other, but it's the constant presence. It's the scrum. They're pushing... Mm-hmm. Nobody pushes back. And so then Taiwan's air defenses are so used to having massive presence of, China, of communist uh, combat aircraft in their airspace, it makes it easier to, to overwhelm them. So again, how do, you, how do you mess with their happiness? If I were Taiwan, I would use an airborne IED, improvised explosive device, a, a missile type device, fly it out in front of that formation of Chinese aircraft, crack it off. And um, you can use some very, very small millings of uh, like tungsten steel, which will almost be like, uh, like dust, so that those dozens of, of communist aircraft fly through that cloud, and it will absolutely shred their engines. It's not going to shoot them down, but every engine on every aircraft will have to be replaced immediately if those aircraft even make it back to mainland China. What, so again, you have to- Beijing deli- do in response to that? Deliver consequence- not shooting them down with a missile, but you're degrading their engines. Again, they're coming into your airspace. How are you gonna? How are you gonna do that? How are you gonna push back um, without just flat out shooting them down? So, with, so with Beijing moving these assets, you know, closer and 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 basically harassing Taiwan, what does the U.S. naval presence look like in the region? It's intermittent at best, and and once in a while they do a freedom of navigation to sail one ship through the Taiwan Straits. But that's about it. Now, China routinely um, uh, sails an aircraft carrier, their aircraft carrier battle group, and dozens of other warships surrounding Taiwan constantly. Again, it's like a, um, in the Major League Baseball, you have a batter that crowds the plate, and once in a while, the pitcher has to, uh, has to remind him who's in charge of that batter's box, and it's not the batter, uh, and you have to, uh, to thump him once in a while. And, and China hasn't been thumped in that space in a long time. All right. We got a lot more to do about Taiwan and talk about the future, but you know we need to talk about the U.S. economy and unfortunately how we've made ourselves vulnerable to China. When well, we're back in just a minute, imagine a technology company built to restore your privacy, not take it away. You and your phone are constantly bombarded with tracking, surveillance, propaganda, and digital attacks. Even big tech companies claiming to protect privacy create their own back doors. Unplugged restores what's been lost, starting with a messenger, a VPN, a mobile antivirus. The Unplugged app bundle gives you back what's rightfully yours. 
Unplugged. Restore your privacy. Okay, we're off leash talking about China. We just covered uh, the South China Sea. We talked about Taiwan. Now we got to talk about the U.S. economy. Eric, what the hell have we been doing for all these decades? China now holds perhaps a trillion dollars in, in U.S. debt, maybe a lot more. Way more than that. Look, the, again, sorry to go back on you here, but um, you had Mao, China over the last 20 centuries, 2,000 years, has been a huge GDP, sometimes the largest in the world, but always up there. And then the communists take over in 1949, and they do some crazy things like the Great Leap Forward, which was this forced collectivization and all the, the, the communist stuff that some people in America here want to, want to try. Starving millions of their own Starving people. Starving tens of millions of their own people, mm -hmm. causing, there's no wild animals left in China because they've eaten them all. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, we can have a whole segment on, mm -hmm. on that. But, and then they go to the Cultural Revolution, and then Deng, Mao dies in the late 70s, a guy named Deng Xiaoping, uh, takes over and he says, whoa, we need to stop. And, and the first trip he goes is to Singapore, which is basically run by Mandarin, ethnic Mandarin Chinese, but it's been run on a free market and it's spectacular. And he said, okay, we're going to do more of that. And so then they start their, their run of, of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, which was much more of an embrace of capitalism and really letting some segments go run wild with entrepreneurship. And that's really what grew the Chinese economy. And but then, the the elites in uh, the coastal elites in Washington said, if we make China rich, it'll become like us. And that's when all these free trade agreements and the World Trade Organization happened, and you gutted middle America, and 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 American manufacturing could not compete with the state subsidized, extremely low cost everything that China was putting out, and their quality wasn't very good. And so that destroyed much of middle America, and it made China very rich, and it didn't make them more free. It made them even greater commies. You had the Tiananmen Square, where they killed thousands of their own people just for kind of protesting for freedom. And that continued up until the election of Donald Trump, which, like I said before, China's been like the neighbor moving their fence into our yard in every way. And he's the first one that said, get the hell back on your side of the fence. Right. Yes, we can cooperate. You're a great power, fine, but we're a great power, and and respect that, and and it this this attitude of resignation that we we should be accept we should be uh, happy eventually being in second place, which is what the Obama administration had been pushing, was was refuted by Trump because the economy really took off again, and and so now China is really they've now elected. Um, Xi Jinping. Uh, he's just been there in office for 10 years. And he got himself reelected to a third term and really for a, a lifetime term because lifetime. The, the leaders of China had been doing 10 years and out. And this guy has accumulated more personal power than any, anybody there since Mao. And I would say probably more power than Mao because he has absolute political control and he has a much bigger economy and a much bigger military to swing as a bat. A lot more middle income Chinese. Yes. By hundreds yes. of millions, literally. And so, but he's done a, a huge clampdown on any of his political opposition on the big industrialists, a guy like Jack Ma, who started mm -hmm. Alibaba, which is a big mm -hmm. online uh, sales trading organization, does mm -hmm. a, a, an eye watering amount of volume in a country with 1.4 billion people. And then they, he disappeared from public view for months. And then he reappeared teaching at an elementary school in some remote part of China. And the official state mouthpiece of China said he had embraced supervision. <laughs> yeah. He had said some critical things about the central bank of, of uh, China and they smashed him. And he's like the Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs equivalent in one guy in China and they smashed him. But talk about uh, using someone as an example. Oh, yeah, you can be the biggest oligarch in all of China. They made an and example we're of him. Stick you in a primary school and teach and teaching little kids. Yes, uh, and they literally. So a lot of his money had been parked overseas, and they sent him abroad with a state security team 
of MOIS agents to go sign over the accounts back to Beijing. So they seized his assets, even abroad, by keeping his family stuck in China, and they sent old Jack out to, uh, to collect up the money and send it back to Beijing. Incredible. So they have him by the balls, and, and, and so that's an example. So Xi is all about maximizing that power, and he has stated his goal is the retaking, the reabsorbing Taiwan into their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, along comes Donald Trump, and they really did not expect him to win in the first place, and then they did not expect him to be as strong and to stand up to him, and they really didn't know how to take him. And so they love the idea of the predictability, the, 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 the managed decline that they experienced on the Obama administration. Sure. loved it. They expected that to continue under With Biden. Hillary. And now you've had many, many uh, Secretary of State, Treasury, Labor, John Kerry, all these people going to China and they're-, they're Gavin they're, Newsom. And, they're, yeah, and their first huh. big goals to talk about is climate change and all the rest, not, not trade, 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 human rights, climate change intellect, with intellectual China, property. Who opens a new coal plant every month? No, no. Two coal, two coal plants a week. <laughs> okay. And they subsidize it and they burn every kind of coal, not just the, the high end anthracite or bituminous, but they're burning lignite coal, which is like, like mm -hmm. peat. It's like lumpy, mm -hmm. lumpy dry mud. Mm -hmm. Very smoky. So, I've actually been in Beijing and experienced black snow. Came out of the airport, it was snowing, and the stuff that was accumulating on cars was black. So, yes, they don't really take air quality so seriously there. Um, so it's, it's such a lie for the U.S. to be crushing the U.S. economy with these environmental standards, while China does exactly the opposite because they're all about economic hegemony. And, and, and they're allowed to get away with it because we have unserious people making decisions for which they don't have to live by the consequences. Okay, so we go through these decades where we are spending, 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 and it's all debt, a good portion of it is, you know, we're borrowing from China. The entire Iraq and Afghanistan wars funded by debt. All of it. Yes. At the same time, we basically hand over manufacturing jobs in the millions, in the millions of people. Decimating communities, causing true despair and drug use and all the bad things that come when people lose their jobs. Right. And here we are today with our southern border collapsed. We know China is pumping fentanyl uh, in through yes. our southern border to destroy American lives. About, they killed 110,000 Americans last year with fentanyl. And these are not druggies. You know, these are not drug no. addicts in the back of an alley. A lot of these people are just popping a pill they had no idea was laced with fentanyl. Correct. And it is a direct, it is a direct covert action program run by China to, to denigrate, to destroy American civil society. You know, the moment that we knew or that China should have known that uh, things had changed was when Xi Jinping was at Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump. Donald Trump excuses himself from the dinner, goes and gives the signal to fire off rockets into Syria, correct? To deliver consequences to Assad because Assad had um, used chemical weapons on his own citizens. Right. Something exactly. that Barack Obama said was a red line. Red line. Who did nothing. Trump did it. He called it in between dinner and dessert to say, okay, deliver consequences to Assad. And sure enough, they did. And, that was a, and it was a triple F you to the Russians, and the Chinese and the Iranians, because Damas Damascus is one of the most high air defense areas in the world, and the U.S. shot at them and penetrated those targets from three directions, from the Med, from the Red Sea, and from the Persian Gulf. And Donald Trump says, here's your red line, pal. He goes back to the dinner table, right, to eat his dessert, leans over and tells Xi, hey, by the way, I just signaled my approval to, to drop, you know, uh, yeah, believe me. bombs into Syria. What did that... What did Xi, Xi Jinping walk away understanding in that moment? He understands that there were red lines, that, that, they're, that they're in the scrum, that, there, there was a, there was, that the U.S. was not uh, averse to delivering consequences. And, and now? And to proceed with caution. And now for three years, we're back to the, the mushy... Managed decline. Managed decline.
just the blurred lines. I don't want to live in a country with managed decline. Build in the South China Sea, no consequences. Continue to, to import all the oil that you need. Go ahead and threaten Taiwan, who we've said that we're going to help defend if we were pushed to do so. Threaten well, Taiwan, threaten madness. all the neighbors, the Philippines, the, the, the everywhere. They um... Spending trillions more, right? Yes. Biden administration and, and Democrats controlled Congress the first two years. What was their mission during that time? Spend. Spend us into oblivion to, to pay off all of their To pay off their Democrat friends. Right. And all that is borrowed money. Uh, Ukraine, borrowed money. All of it. Another $2 trillion this year. Deficit that we're running. Deficit. Annual. Yes. Extraordinary. What, what's the... Give, give me... It was supposed to be $1.4 trillion. They missed it by $600 billion. So we're going to be over $2 trillion. And so now, China, again, actively preparing their economy to be sanction-proof. Like I said, se selling off the big assets. Um, um, stockpiling huge amounts of, of energy, of hydrocarbons. And of food, I mean, think about it, when they had the COVID lockdowns um, uh, a year ago last fall. Yeah, uh, a year ago right now. Right. As Xi was accumulating uh, power at his um, party congress, there was true famines in Shanghai, and they wouldn't release any of the food because it was for him. It was about maintaining and, and closing that control. And, uh, and in that congress, he even had you know, one of his rivals taken out. He did. Um, <laughs> Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao was physically arrested and dragged out of the great hall of the people um, in front of those guys as a double FU, I'm in charge. And he cleaned out any of the other non-loyalists to him and, and, and to the point of even firing um, the experienced technocrats that were in the finance ministries, et cetera, and replace them with absolute party loyalists. All right, so his, his personal loyalists. So Xi's got absolute power. They're basically in a wartime footing, right? They're they're stockpiling. They're preparing for a possible war. Yeah, Take when, you're, a, when, when your enemy is telling you what he's going to do, right? We're preparing for a great conf conflict. We're taking economic measures to prepare for it. We should probably take them seriously. When Hamas was saying, "Yes, we from the from the river to the sea, right. mm -hmm. and and we ex the Hamas mm -hmm. is going to annihilate Israel," mm -hmm. um, listen to that, expect that, and and the di diplomatic happy talk in the willful ignorance displayed in Washington is absolutely unacceptable, and it must be changed, or we're all going to suffer all for right, it. So we're going to exit here in a moment, but give me your look ahead between now and election. Day 2024. What does this look like with China? High chance of China doing something this spring. Uh, the good time for amphibious invasion is around April, May, early June. By the time you get past June, July, you're getting to typhoon season and never a great time to do an invasion during a typhoon. So again, the amount of, of asymmetric war scrum that Russia and Ukraine, um, Iran, uh, in Gaza, maybe in Lebanon, now in Yemen, um, high likelihood of, of shit starting in the South China Sea. That's where... Buckle up. This is extraordinary where, where we've come in such a short period of time, and China is driving most of the agenda. Unbelievable. All right. We appreciate you being here with us. Remember, we're now on Rumble and YouTube, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, across all audio podcast platforms. Look us up, tell, tell your friends, because we are off leash with Eric Prince. Thanks for joining us.